Good morning, everybody. It's good to be with you on this beautiful Lord's Day. Please have your Bibles open to Luke chapter 4. We're going to begin there in just a moment. I want to welcome all of our visitors again and invite you back anytime that you have the opportunity. We're going to be worshiping again and, and uh, having some Bible studies on Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. You're always invited. If you have any questions about what we say or do, please uh, let us know after services. And if you filled out a visitor's card and haven't given that to somebody, there's going to be a couple of men coming through the audience at the end. And if you could put that in there, we'd like to have a, a record of your attendance. It's been like two years since I've been up here. Uh, feels like it anyway, about six weeks or so. Uh, didn't preach in, in October because I had a, a meeting up in, in Prescott. And I do appreciate the elders for giving me the, the month off with my secular job and preaching a meeting. It's uh, quite a busy month, but... I appreciate their flexibility and such a joy to preach, such a joy to talk about Jesus, what He did for us. Um, you just can't talk about it enough. He's everything to us. What would I have to do for you to want to murder me at the end of this lesson? And I want you to think literally, if, if that's even possible. Preach a long-winded sermon? No, I'm kidding. I, I won't do that, I promise. But seriously, what, what would have to happen at the end of this sermon for you to say, in your mind at least, I want to kill that guy? And something like that happens in the life of Jesus. There's a worship service. There's a Bible study that's going to end in Luke chapter 4 with attempted murder. And what's unbelievable about this account is that they loved the sermon at first. They didn't like the application, but they loved the sermon and then wanted to kill Jesus and actually make an attempt. And here's what he's going to do. We're going to talk more than just these two points, but basically all that Jesus does is give his job description but then he says, Gentiles will listen to this job description better than you. They're going to enjoy the blessings of my job better than you. And that's when the roof blows off and they try to kill Christ. But before we begin reading in verse 16, I want you to see a couple of breadcrumbs. I like to call these breadcrumbs in the context. And these little breadcrumbs, before we actually get to the narrative make the story a little bit more powerful, I think, and it makes uh, studying the Bible in context more powerful. Here's the breadcrumbs I'm talking about. Look at verse 1 of Luke chapter 4. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit. And that's the breadcrumb. What was Jesus full of? He was full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan, and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. So just underline that in, in your mind, or in your Bibles, with your pen or pencil or highlighter or whatever. He was full of the Holy Spirit. Second breadcrumb. Look at verse 14. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. There's our second breadcrumb. He returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And a report about Him went through all the surrounding country. And He taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. I just want you to tuck those two breadcrumbs in the back of your mind. He was full of the Holy Spirit. And he returned to Galilee in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the third breadcrumb, though maybe not as important, is that everybody loved his preaching. Jesus was a head turner when he preached. He was a powerful, powerful preacher. Not because he was dynamic. I mean, maybe he was. We just don't know. He taught as if he had authority. We know that's one of the reasons why he was so listened to. And I don't think that's talking about Jesus having one of those voices, you know. But Jesus just being one of those dynamic speakers that everybody is just drawn to. But He taught as if He was the authority. I am the way, the truth, and the life. You must believe that I am or you'll die in your sins. That kind of authority. But also, one of the reasons I think Jesus was, was people were so drawn to Jesus is because He gave hope to the hopeless. And in fact... That's going to be his job description, or at least one of them. To insert hope where people are hopeless. We read about in his early ministry, Ricky Jenkins talked about this narrative from Mark chapter 2, 
the last night of the meeting. Remember in Capernaum? They were having that gospel meeting there in Capernaum. And it was so jam-packed. And people didn't want to give up their seats to the point where they would not even make a path for four guys to take a paralyzed man to Jesus. And they had to get up on the roof. We read in his early ministry about people crowding Jesus so badly on the beach that he's got to get on some watercraft just to get away from the crowd. And then he teaches them from the, the watercraft to the people on the beach. People loved to listen to Jesus. What does verse 15 say? He was being glorified by all. And yet he's about to walk into a Bible study that will end with attempted murder? Begin reading with me in verse 16. We're going to stop after verse 16 and say something that's maybe not as related to the sermon, but look at what it was that Jesus had a custom of doing. Verse 16, Luke chapter 4, He came to Nazareth where He had been brought up, and as was His custom, He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and He stood up to read. Reading on the synagogue was not His practice, what it says was his practice was that he went to synagogue on the Sabbath day. Jesus, the Son of God, regularly attended Bible studies. And you know what's so remarkable about this synagogue Bible study? You cannot read anywhere in the Old Testament where Moses or the prophets or anybody commanded anyone to go to synagogue. And you know why that is. Synagogues didn't become popular until the intertestamental period. After the prophets stopped and before Jesus was born, that's where synagogues became popular, where they would get together on Saturdays, the Sabbath, and get together for Bible studies. And what I'm saying is, is that this type of Bible study was not required to go to. Well, Wednesday night isn't required. Neither was this. And the Son of God went to Bible studies. Isn't that amazing? That's amazing to me. And what makes this even more amazing, not that it wasn't commanded, and it wasn't, <coughs> Jesus never learned anything at Bible study. Did you know that? I mean, Jesus never sat in synagogue Bible study and said, well, I've never thought about the Song of Solomon like that before. <laughs> He's the author of what they were studying I've never thought about that proverb in that context before. Jesus never said anything like that. And you might be saying, well, Jesus went to synagogues, verse 14, one of our breadcrumbs, to teach. And He did that. But if you study up on synagogue services, there were seven Bible readers. And it was their duty to expound on what they were reading. In fact, they had rules about how many verses they could read before they expounded. They had a rule a tradition that they could read one verse from the law and then interpret, but they could read two or three verses from the prophets and then interpret. So Jesus heard a lot of teaching other than himself there at synagogue Bible studies, and the Son of God had a custom of attending Bible studies. Beloved, we're about to have Wednesday night Bible study here at 7, and I probably would guess about half of us are going to be there. And I wonder why that is. I know work comes up. I know darkness for some elderly people come up. And sickness come up. And I get all of that. I'm asking, is it your custom to come when you can come? And my opinion is, as a father and a husband, that if Jesus Christ had a custom of going to Bible studies, the Greeley family should probably have that custom too. And that's as deep as it gets with me and my family. Now let's re read the rest of the narrative. Jesus is about to give His job description from our Scripture reading this morning. Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2. They, he didn't just go to Bible study. They, they put Him on the duty roster. He stood up to read. At verse 17. And let's just read the whole narrative and kind of go back and, and, and scroll our way through it. Verse 17. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. What's on Jesus? Or He's going to say this is talking about me in just a moment. But what was our breadcrumb in verse 1? He was full of the Holy Spirit. Verse 14, He came into Galilee in the power of the Holy Spirit. Here He's reading a Scripture saying the Spirit 
All right, so we got our breadcrumbs. we got some context here. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He anointed me to, pre- uh, to, an- to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and set at liberty those who are oppressed. To proclaim the, the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming out, out of his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly, I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up for three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them were cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath, and they drove him out of the town, brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. A Bible study that ended in attempted murder. Unbelievable. And why? They put him on the duty roster. And they gave him the scroll of Isaiah. And the text says in verse 17 that he found the place. And I think what that's saying is they they didn't give him Isaiah 61 as the scripture reading. They gave him the, the scroll of Isaiah and he had the opportunity to read whatever he wanted. He found this place in Isaiah 61, what we know is Isaiah 61. And he read this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. To do what? Why were you full of the Holy Spirit, Jesus? Why did you return into Galilee full in 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 the power of the Spirit? We think miracles automatically. When we think of full of the Holy Spirit and power of the Holy Spirit, my mind immediately goes to miracles. But what this text says is that it needs to go to preaching. That the Spirit was on Jesus to preach to the poor. People who had minimum wage jobs and struggled paycheck to paycheck? I don't think that this is talking about that. Well, what did Jesus say in the great Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verse 3? Blessed are the poor, what? In their pockets? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Imagine if you had a poor spirit, if you were destitute in spirit, and Jesus came up, He put put His arm around you and said, Yours is the kingdom of of heaven. Wouldn't that put a bounce in your step? What's the Spirit on Jesus for? To liberate people enslaved. That's Jubilee language. We studied a few years ago two lessons that I did on the the year of Jubilee. Go back to Leviticus chapter 25 and reread those passages if you will. The year of Jubilee, it came around once in a lifetime, for most people anyway, once every 50 years. And what did they do with their indentured servants? They let them go. They let their slaves go every 50 years and gave land back. If people had to sell off land because they got on hard times, the land would ultimately be returned to them in the year of Jubilee. I think we have a hard time understanding what a free slate, what a clean slate the year of Jubilee would be. And Jesus is saying the Spirit is on me to liberate enslaved people, give sight to the blind. Think it's talking about physical blindness? He did that. But even in John chapter 9, when Jesus heals a physically blind man, where does the conversation end up? The Pharisees ask him at the end of John chapter 9, Are we blind too? They're not talking about physical blindness. Are we blind too? And Jesus says, Yes. Because you say you see. You're actually blind. If you would admit your blindness, I could work with you. I could open your eyes. When Jesus appears to to Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus, when he's going to arrest those Christians, boom, Jesus appears in the sky, a great bright light, and he's blinded. And when Jesus calls him to be an apostle, when he's relaying the story in Acts chapter 26, he says, I'm going to send you to the Gentiles to do what to their eyes? To open 
their eyes. What Jesus was saying on the road to Damascus, Paul, your job, or Saul at that time, Saul, your job is the same as mine was. You're going to give sight to spiritually blind people. What was the Spirit on Jesus for? To liberate the oppressed. When I think of oppressed, I don't think of slavery. Liberate people who are oppressed. This is my favorite of this bunch. And I'll tell you why it's my favorite. Because it's all of us. I mean, you, you could say this about all of these things. But listen to how this word was used. Did you know that in the Greek New Testament, the language that the New Testament was written, this is the only time this Greek word appears in the entire New Testament. So I did some digging. In the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, this Greek term comes up 22 times. And just from that Septuagint, I want to put up some ways that this word was used. Listen to this. And when you see them, just ask yourself, hey, hey, you know, don't we use that word in that way in our culture? Broken. We say things like, he's a broken man. We got any of those? She's a broken woman. Overwhelmed if you're a parent. Of course, I don't think this is talking about being overwhelmed in our parenting. I think this is talking about being overwhelmed with guilt. Being overwhelmed with our sense of sinfulness. Does that describe anybody in this room? Sure it does. Flying into pieces. This is actually connected with the very first one, which is broken. But in the Septuagint, it's actually used of physical things falling down and shrapnel coming out. And don't we use the phrase... I'm picking up the pieces of a broken relationship. I'm picking up the pieces of a, of a broken marriage, a broken house. Anybody got any shrapnel in their lives? Exhausted. I'm sick and tired. And when people say that, they're not talking about getting an eight hours night of sleep. They're talking about how they are sick and tired of their life. If you were in the side classroom, Mitch and Veronica were saying, Mitch was relaying a conversation that he had with Veronica about how they were talking about how people get through life without the Lord. How is that even possible? Well, it's not, it's not really. It's not really possible without feeling these feelings. I'm convinced, no matter how people show up at at work with their shirt tucked in and their hair combed that they feel like this and so do I at times to feel panic anybody watch news anymore I'm trying to get out of that I don't care what your flavor is CNN or Fox News or mainstream if there is such a thing those news anchors are in such a panic Hollywood didn't have anything on those news anchors and what they're doing is they're trying to get me to feel that kind of panic. Our whole society is in a panic. People are walk and maybe we should be in a panic. People are walking into schools and theaters and shooting dozens of people. Unbelievable. Yeah, I, I feel some panic, and maybe rightly so from time to time. And yet Jesus is saying the Spirit is on me to help you fix all that. <coughs> And finally, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This, too, is jubilee language. Because Jesus doesn't say, I'm here to proclaim the week. You know, there were some holidays that lasted week long. I'm here to, pro to proclaim the, the day of the Lord's favor. There were some holidays that lasted one day. But how many holidays in the Old Testament lasted for a full year? There was just one. The year of jubilee. And did you know that we have no record of the Israelites ever celebrating Jubilee? We have no record in the Old Testament of the Jews ever celebrating Jubilee, and yet here we have a Jew showing up in a Galilean synagogue and saying, I'm here to start it! And when you think about their history of not celebrating it, I think this would blow an Israelite's mind. This guy? 
is, is here to tell us that we're going to start proclaiming the, the year of Jubilee. And that's what he says. He says this isn't going to be a fulfillment later on. This is a fulfillment right here in this synagogue. Look at what he says in verse 20. He rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, sat down. I used to think that when he sat down, he was done. No, to a Jewish rabbi, that means you're just getting started. They, when they sat, that means they were ready to teach. We're doing the opposite now. You're sitting, I'm standing. Jewish rabbis sat to teach. Jesus isn't getting done. He's just getting started. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began. This is his introduction. I want you to underline that word began. He, he just started telling them, okay, today, not in this generation, not this month, not this year, not in this decade. He says today, in this synagogue, this scripture has, is fulfilled in your hearing. And I think what Jesus is doing in his introduction part of the sermon is he's saying to these Jews, all right, here's what my sermon is about. I'm about to preach a sermon that preaches good news to the poor. I'm about to preach a sermon that liberates people enslaved. I'm about to preach a sermon that gives sight to blind people. I'm about to give a sermon that liberates people who are oppressed and exhausted and broken down and the pieces of their lives are flying all over like shrapnel. And I'm about to preach a sermon that lights a fire of the year of Jubilee. Wouldn't you want to hear a sermon like that? I wish we could log on to the synagogue website and listen to that sermon audibly. And yet we have it. We have it in the gospel. Today, this scripture is, is fulfilled in your hearing. And how did they respond to a sermon like that? Now you might be saying, well, Alan, they're about to try to kill Christ. Of course they hated the sermon. No, 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 no. no. They loved it. They loved the sermon. But they hated his background. Look at verse 22 with me. They hated his upbringing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming out of his mouth. They loved the sermon, but they had some hesitation about really buying in. Why? Is this not Joseph's son? I mean, didn't we see Jesus grow up here in Nazareth? You know, Matthew's account says, Is this not the carpenter's son? And Mark's account says it eliminates the word son in the Greek. What Mark records is them saying, is this not the carpenter? Question mark. You know what they had a problem with? Is his blue collarness. Yeah, we, we hear the eloquent sermon. We, we hear the gracious words of Isaiah 61. We hear him telling us, that today that's going to be a fulfillment. We love that. But isn't this guy just a woodworker? You remember when Ricky Jenkins was here and he was talking about in his home congregation how people are, are from all different backgrounds and, and social economic statuses. And that's true of every, every congregation. But he said, we've got doctors and lawyers. And then he said, we've got tree trimmers. You remember that? Imagine in Ricky Jenkins' congregation, one of those tree trimmers gets up and preaches better than Ricky. Now, we all heard Ricky. <laughs> he did an amazing job. He's an amazing speaker, eloquent, gracious, all of that. Now, can you imagine one of the tree trimmers getting up there in Dallas and preaching better than Ricky? And I guarantee if we were in the audience, we'd be saying, this guy needs to get out of the tree trimming business. Isn't this the, just a tree trimmer? And maybe that gives you a sense of how we can empathize with these Nazarenes. Isn't this guy just a, a woodworker? But it wasn't just his blue collarness. It was that they knew his family. They knew his background. He's just the little boy that we saw growing up. And isn't that what we think of when we, when we see our young men become Christians and sometimes they give invitations or scripture readings and the first thing that comes to my mind, maybe I'm, maybe I'm the problem. First thing that comes to my mind is, wow, they've come a long way. Isn't that sweet? And, I, and I've been there. Many of you know I grew up in Glendale, just across town, and I worshipped as a young boy 
with my family at the Valley Congregation, and I've gone over there to preach a few times, and every single time I've ever gone there and preached, somebody inevitably will say, I remember you when you were just... And it, it didn't, bo- didn't bother me. I remember you when you were in my third grade class, and, and you didn't know any of the questions. That's okay. <laughs> no, that, they don't say that, but... I remember you when you were just running the hallway. Doesn't bother me. It's human nature. Jesus got it. Doesn't bother me at all. But here's the problem. And here, here's what I want to preach. When we hear from our young men, and our young men get up here and preach an invitation or give a scripture reading or whatever, if we are not listening for truth's sake, If we're more apt to listen to Ricky Jenkins than a boy who grew up here, even though they're talking about the same thing and reading the same verses, are we listening to truth for the sake of truth? And if we're not, if that's getting in the way, we might be Nazarenes. And I don't mean that as a compliment. You know what bothers me about this story? And it really does kind of bother me. That Jesus could have left this audience and never had a problem. Right here, I mean, it says they're they're marveling at his gracious words. Yes, they're they're kind of having a hard time with his with his background. They're kind of having a hard time that isn't this the little boy that grew up here? And they're kind of having a hard time with his blue collarness. But he could have just walked out of that synagogue and said, "All right, guys, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. Let's go somewhere else." But Jesus didn't. Jesus didn't do what I would do, which is just leave. He said, I'm going to go somewhere else. Instead, he took his thumb, he put it on the nerve, and he pressed down. And he tells this audience, okay, no no prophet is acceptable. I'm, I'm okay with that. But you Nazarenes, you don't have any indication." of accepting the blessings that I'm talking about, but Gentiles will. And that's when the roof blew off. And he says, I'm going to give you two last stories before I leave. There was a lot of Israelite widows in the time of Elijah, weren't there? When the heavens were shut up and there was a big famine for three and a half years. Three and a half years. Can you imagine the the devastation that that would happen that, that would happen on animals and land, for it to go dry for three and a half years, people were starving. And Jesus is saying, that it wasn't because of a lack of Israelite widows that Elijah d- didn't help them, but Elijah was sent to a widow in Seraphath in the land of Sidon, a Gentile widow, and she was helped. She received the blessings from God. And there wasn't a lack of Israelite lepers in the time of Elisha, They were a dime a dozen. Some of our Old Testament is just dedicated to leprosy itself. There was Israelite widows all over the place. But the one leper that received the blessings from God was a Gentile commander. And you can see what Jesus is saying, can't you? The Gentiles will receive the blessings of Isaiah 61 before you. They didn't just want to take him off the duty roster. They wanted to take him off the face of the planet. And they led him off to a protuberance in some hill, which scholars say could have been this one right here. That's why I use this picture. To throw him off and to kill him. And he escaped. Last point, and the lesson is yours. There are people in the church, and I'm not talking Nazarenes anymore. There's people in the church that will listen to sermons all day, every day, that are theory-based, hear the truth of those lessons, and amen every second of it. Until we get to application. And that's where people get offended. And I wonder if that's how you listen. We can talk about the, the Pharisees' hypocrisy, and we... Amen! Doing things for the glory of man, those fairs. Amen to that. 
They rejected Jesus there in Nazareth. Amen to that. That's what happened. But as soon as we start talking about our own hypocrisy, as soon as we start talking about doing things in the church for the glory of men, as soon as we start taking our thumb and pressing down on the nerve, and then there's a lot less amening going on. And I just wonder, did you come here to receive a theory-based lesson? Or did you come in here with the constructive thinking, I want something to help me become more like Jesus Christ? Is that what you came? I hope you got a sermon to help you in that, in that area. Please get out your songbooks and turn to the Song of Invitation. Jesus went to Bible studies. Remarkable. That was his custom. Is it going to be your custom? Jesus said, here's my job description, Isaiah 61. I'm here to preach to poor people. I'm here to liberate people who are enslaved. I'm here to give sight. I'm here to liberate people who are broken and exhausted and overwhelmed. I'm here to start Jubilee where servants and slaves are released and you get a clean, free slate. Listen to truth for, for the sake of truth. And don't listen to theory-based sermons. You can study the book of Leviticus and make application. I hope that you get something out of this sermon. If today is the day of your salvation, we have water behind me, we can baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ, and you can walk away, forgiven person by the blood of the Lamb. Will you come? As together we stand and sing.